welcome everyone to this installment of the department's conservation lecture series. My name is Whitney Albright and I work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife here at the Science Institute. And I help to facilitate the lecture series along with my colleague, Nicole Russell, who's on the line as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as, usual, as usual, before I introduce our guest speaker, I do have a few quick announcements before we get going. Um, as you've probably already noticed, you've all been muted as you've come on the line, and that's to help us kind of preserve the audio quality for our recording. Uh, so we are recording the talk today, and it will be posted within the next couple of weeks onto our Conservation Lecture Series website, and the website link is here at the bottom of the page. So be sure to check that out. If you know of someone who maybe wasn't able to attend today, uh, please feel free to kind of share the word and, and let folks know that the talk will be available after today. Uh, so as far as flow today, I'll turn it over to our, our guest speaker here in just a minute and we'll have a presentation for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll have a dedicated uh, time for questions and answers at the end. So we are going to save the discussion for the end of the meeting today. However, I do encourage you to type your questions into the chat box throughout the presentation as they come up, and I will be sure to relay all of those to our speaker at the end of the day. So feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat box. And let's see here. Um, one more thing, please do save the date for our next talk, which has been scheduled for December 15th, which is a Tuesday from 10.30 uh, in the morning to noon. We'll be hearing from several different speakers who are working together on a project. We'll hear from Melanie gogol Prograt and Sandra Hill with the department, and then also Jim Thorne with UC Davis. And they'll be um, sharing some of their work to evaluate climate impacts to species habitat um, in California based on a wildlife habitat relationships model, and also based on a vulnerability assessment for vegetation in the state. So please save the date for that. And of course, in advance, we'll send out a registration link and an announcement that you can share um, and, and go ahead and set up um, your registration in advance. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Israel Borokini. And Israel is a PhD candidate at the UC University of Nevada in Reno in their Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology graduate program. And his dissertation is employing a holistic approach to advance scientific knowledge and produce empirical information that supports the management of a federally threatened perennial forb in the Great Basin Desert, which we'll be talking more about today. And Israel is interested in a career in conservation biogeography, the science policy interface, ecosystem services, and invasive species management. So please join me in giving a, work, a virtual welcome to Israel today. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing my PowerPoint here and we'll switch it up. Hi everyone. Thank you very much, Nick or Whitney for that introduction. And uh, I'm excited to be here this afternoon to be sharing uh, some of the findings of my research with you uh, that I've been doing for the past couple of years. Uh, I'm so excited to be in your midst this afternoon. I have always loved not just doing research, but also doing research that informs management. Um, I believe audio is good, video is good, you can go ahead and start, right? Good, thank you. So today I'll be talking about uh, iterative niche modeling and adaptive sampling, which has resulted in the discovery of novel locations for the and then, uh, threat, federally threatened uh, Ibiza webera uh, species. Um, this is a little bit different because this is a study that I've carried out over the last five years of studying. I started with about 16 points or, or 16 locations of the species. And there's not a lot you can do with it, especially if you don't have a lot of information. So over the couple of years, I did a lot of studies, a lot of niche modeling, and also going out to the field, looking at areas where the species were predicted to be suitable to see if we can in fact find any new population or location, and that resulted in the discovery of many new locations. 
So uh, as a way of getting started, who, what is an ecological niche? Uh, in layman's language, you say that ecological niche is the range of conditions that support persistence. And that will include the favorable biotic environment, a favorable abiotic environment, and the ability of the species to be able to migrate to get to that point. So if you pick up one random species in North America and you fit a niche model for it and you project it to Europe, for example, there might be some favorable environment that you can find in Europe for the species, but the species may not have the ability to be able to naturally migrate to that area. And so that's why uh, the natural niche or ecological niche of a species is made up of the of areas that are favorable for the species, both in terms of species interactions or biotic interactions, abiotic factors, that is the right temperature, the right precipitation and what have you, and as well as the ability for that species to be able to get to that place. And sometimes, especially because of uh, the Eltonian niche, uh, some of the uh, previous studies or papers have been written about niche, um, uh, what Dr. John Elton also explained uh, ecological niche in terms of the position or the functional role of a species in the ecosystem, in terms of is, is the species a herbivore, is it a, uh, is it a carnivore, and things like that. So these are some of different explanations that people have about the ecological niche. And I'm sure many of you must have seen in literature, people have different names, they call it. Some call it habitat models, come, some call it climatic envelopes, bioclimatic models, species distribution models, and so on and so forth. But in reality, ecological niche models, they fit models that describe the conditions that support species persistence and the spatial distributions of those conditions. And what do we use to do that? We use the occurrence points, areas where we know that the species has been detected uh, over uh, currently, at least in most cases, we use current points where the species is found. In addition to true absence points, area where we know that we have sampled and we know that the species is not there. But if we don't have that information, um, we could use uh, statistical models to generate some what we call pseudo absence points and so we use those absence points in addition to the occurrence points uh, uh, to fit niche models using some predictors, which could be environmental variables like temperature, precipitation, and so on. It could also be functional traits like, like, uh, the, the, like some morphological characteristics of the species or um, what have you. Or it could also be genetic cluster like the, like the genotype clustering of the species, you know, if perhaps if you are interested in asking questions that has to do with local adaptation. So um, this is kind of like an introduction to ecological niche. And what are the statistical assumptions that follow the fitting of models? Because it's really statistic heavy. And, it's, and one thing to understand is that ecological niche models mostly are correlative in nature, except mechanistic models, which I will not go into details today. Um, what we normally do is that we use the range of the values. Like, for example, if you find a, a, a random hypothetical species in a particular area, we take the temperature, we take the precipitation, we take several other factors or uh, the values of those environmental variables in that area and then we and then go to project it to other areas that where you can find exactly the same combination of that same uh, environmental variables as where you find the species and and different algorithms do this differently some they they, they use some kind of smoothing functions some some other algorithms, they use some classification, some do regression. And so that's why you have different algorithms having different projections, performing differently when you use them in niche models, because most of them are really correlative um, models. You are just basically using the values of the species in where you find it, in the environment where you find it, and to find out which other areas in the range where you are doing the study as exactly the same um, uh, combination of environmental variables. And because of that, so many, uh, there are some statistical assumptions that are 
associated with niche modeling. But uh, for example, for us to be able to fit a niche model accurately, the algorithms we use, they make an assumption that the variables we are using, they actually have real interactions. They, the species has direct relationship with these variables. So it is, that is one of the reasons why many people have written papers about direct and indirect variables, proximal, approximate and distal variables and so on and so forth uh, because they because the variables that must should be used experts have already uh, recommended that variables to be used for this kind of modeling should be variables that has direct relationship with the species and secondly another important assumption is that the species is in uh, equilibrium with this environment that is we know the true range or the spatial extent of the species. For example, there are some species that are found in California and they've not been able to migrate or, or to cross the Sierra Nevada range to be able to cross into the Great Basin and so on and so forth. So uh, in, in such a case, we can make some assumptions, and in some cases, you cannot make that, that assumption that a species is in equilibrium with its environment. And that is a very, very important assumption being made by these uh, ecological niche models. And many of, interestingly, and that's why some people, some scientists, especially when they go to scientific meetings, they argue partly about these uh, assumptions because many of the algorithms we use and some many of the spatial data we use they often violate these assumptions and so many people question how are we sure that the models that you just fitted are accurate how, can, how are we sure that their predictions are accurate and that is one of the reasons why i did not just fit the models and publish the paper and just go away but actually go out or to the field, do some field validation, do some sampling of those areas where the model says that it is suitable for the species, go there to find out whether the, the species is in fact found in that area. And niche, but despite all these assumptions and criticisms against niche models, they are very important application, especially in conservation field. For example, we can use niche models to predict the uh, some variables that are responsible for, for the expansion or the shrinkage of a species range in the past or likely going to happen in the future. And that's one of the basis for many of the future projection of what the species range will look like under climate change. If you are sure that a species has a direct relationship with the climatic variable, we can use the, the projection of that species, of that climatic variable in the future to see what is going to happen to the range or the niche of that species. And we can also do the same thing for, uh, for uh, a backcasting, as they call it, into past a climatic environment. Also, from niche models, we can generate maps of habitat suitability, which we can use to estimate whether the species is rare, whether the habitat of the species is rare or it's widespread, or to estimate the range of the species. We can use the habitat suitability maps to go for field surveys, which is basically what I did. We could also use it, at least some studies have shown that maps of uh, habitat suitability were used to discover some species that were thought to have gone into extinction, they discovered that the species were found elsewhere where it has never been sampled before. And also discovery of new species or discovery of new populations or locations of a species. I will also, also use uh, maps of habitat suitability to, to design landscape corridors and suitable sites for future refugia, talk of translocation experiments. And of course, we can also, uh, for example, for Ivesia Weberia that, I'm, that I worked with, there are several other tags that are within that genus. So I could fit models for all the uh, tags that are in that genus and see where those niches overlap. And I can use that to also contribute to understanding of evolutionary processes within that genus, whether there are some kind of allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation, do, they, do their niches 
uh, overlap with each other and how does that affect or how does that increase our understanding of how speciation occurred within the genus. So niche models has a lot of applications in advancing scientific knowledge and also apply application to conservation uh, management. And of course, because of the fact that many of the conservation prioritization usually is done for range restricted, restricted taxa, for example, a strictly endemic species because of their high risk of extinction or extirpation of their populations. That's why many times a lot of conservation prioritization go favors this kind of species. And niche models is one of the conservation activities or practices that could be used to understand some of these species. But there is a problem there because um, for us to be able to fit niche models for rare or endemic species, the pro we need a lot of points. We need a lot. We need uh, good spatial data. In fact, some of the algorithms we use to fit niche models, they are data hungry. They need a lot of data. Otherwise, they will give very spurious predictions. So there's a paradox there. There's a big uh, challenge in fitting models for rare species without, because we don't have a lot of occurrence points to start with. Many of these species are not in equilibrium with the environment. Some of them, they were probably uh, historically more widespread, but because of changing the environment, their niches are becoming shrinking. We call them paleoendemic species. Or some of them, they were phylogenetically young species. They just recently speciated and they have not had enough time to expand across their entire range. We call them new endemic species. So in this, uh, this kind of species or endemic species, they have not had an equilibrium with the environment. And then in, for many of these species, we don't have true absence points to start with. And I this how we for example, if we have to go for any field studies or any field observation or sampling, we have, have to do it within a one month window period when the species is flowering. If I go anytime before or after that, I, there is low detection probability. And there are many, many other species that are so small like that, that detection probability can be low. Areas where you think the species are not there, they may act, in fact be there, but they were probably not detected. And because of the fact that many of these species are also wild, there's limited knowledge on their species biology. So we don't know what variables are really important to them. For example, when I started working with Ibiza Webera, some of the, some of the uh, experts, or quote unquote, local botanists, they've always argued that soil is an important uh, variable for these species. It's an edaphic endemic species. But from my understanding and my studies of this species so far, I have not found soil to be an important variable. And, and so when we don't have a lot of knowledge on, this, on the biology of this species, it, it limits our, uh, our ability to be able to include important variables for niche modeling. And many of these rare species or endemic species, there's a lot of bias. Uh, the herbarium records we have about them are really biased or, uh, and, and, that, and that can also introduce a lot of uh, uncertainty in the prediction of those niche models. So as of 2015, when I started this study, in fact, interestingly, uh, the, the species was uh, listed as a federally threatened species in June of 2014 and then as around 2015, I got the funding to start this work. And that was when I, I, I became really interested in doing some niche modeling on this species to understand um, the, the geographical spread and what are the factors that are important for this species. As of 2015, I only we only have 16 designated populations in, in scattered along uh, 19 locations. We know, so, as at that time at least we know that the habitats are in the mid elevation site, so they are not in the valley floors, they are in the mid elevation in uh, some uh, mountains surrounding Reno and what have you. Uh, we know that uh, annual regeneration is a mix of seedling, of seed uh, germination, but mostly vegetative regeneration. And regeneration, of course, only uh, uh, towards the end of winter or early spring when there's a, a cold stratification such that um, the 
the snow is melting and there is more moisture in the soil and then the temperature is also gradually rising, increasing in the day and going down at night. So that cold stratification helps in the germination of the seeds and to activate uh, the dormant uh, vegetative uh, structures. We also know in 2015 that it grows typically on dry in xeric soil, which is typical in uh, which is typical in, um, in, in the desert environment. And these typical xeric soils, they have thin surface rocky pavement and a very thick uh, B horizon, which is agilic. That is, it has a lot of clay content in it. Um, we know at least from field observations that this species avoid overlogged area, water over, uh, avoid waterlogged areas and tree cover. It grows in the, um, in, 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 in uh, it avoids tree shades. We also know that uh, most of these sites have been affected by historical or current wildfires, grazing, invasive species, human activities. In fact, interestingly, one of the sites used to be within the, the trail that was that used to be part of the historical Californian trail. That is one of the sites was actually used for California as a part of the Californian trail in, in the 1800s. And uh, it, one study also showed or uh, showed that um, this species is more probably a new endemic species because it recently speciated around between 1.3 to 3.8 million years ago. So that could have a lot of implication. Uh, we could think that the species is probably endemic. Maybe it is not endemic. Maybe it has just not had enough time to expand across its range. What we do not know is the spatial extent of the species. We don't know what variables are important. We don't know what pollinators are, uh, what, what uh, are the effective pollinators of this species. I mean, from field observation, I've seen a lot of insects, uh, especially hymenopterans and lepidopterans visiting this, uh, the flowers during flowering season, but we don't know whether they are actually floral visitors or they are pollinators. We don't know the regeneration, uh, the regeneration niche, the seed biology, the storage behavior, the seed dormancy. We don't really all have clear understanding on this because there's no empirical studies on that. We don't know what are the drivers of coexistence of this species with other species. In most of the sites, you see this species growing with trifolium, with basamoriza, ukeri, and so on and so forth. And we don't know whether the populations are increasing or decreasing, or whether they are stable or in, in in areas where they have been detected. And these are really important information that could be critical for managing this species. So the experimental goals uh, for this study was to fit niche models and uh, from there to be able to find out where the, uh, the, the prediction for these models are more are significantly more accurate than a random model. And to be able to identify which are the, what are the important ecological variables for this species, and also to see whether biotic interactions are important for the niche model, or for the niches, and as well from that to see how additional spatial data from the field surveys, what role did they play in increasing or maybe decreasing the predicted accuracy of these niche models. So in 2015, I had very little data to start with, but thankfully, uh, working with the Nevada Natural Heritage Program, they gave me a bunch of almost 800 true absence points of areas where some of their botanists have been to, and they knew that this species was not found in those areas. So I started with about 788, 758 points, and then I had 21 um, presence points, and I had to thin them down because it's just too many absence points. And some of them were taken from areas that are close to where the species are. So I had to thin them down. And then I used several uh, algorithms and several random variables that I, could, that I could get my hands on because you don't really know what are really important for this species at that point in time. So it was kind of like just a preliminary modeling, if I would call it that way. And that gave us this map that you have in there. The, projected areas. Areas in green are predicted to be suitable. And if you look very, care, very well where you see the cost of that, that test, that is a pyramid lake. And then uh, and then the lake tower is somewhere around there. And so 
But you see, majority of this area is in Northern California. And then you wonder how on earth will you be able to go looking for the species in this huge amount of area being projected to be suitable. And so because of that, I did few surveys in 2015, in 2016, and 2017, going to areas to see where these areas have been predicted to be suitable, whether they are found there. And so I was able to generate additional absence points. And just to also illustrate the fact that different algorithms do things differently, this, mod, this map is from, it was generated from MagSent from maximum entropy. And then this one was generated from random forest. And you can see the areas in green were also predicted to be suitable. You can see dramatic difference between random forest and maxent. And so that, that, that is a very clear demonstration of how different algorithms perform differently uh, using a, even exactly the same variables. So anyways, I did a lot of field surveys in 2015 and 2016 and 2017 looking for areas which, uh, but another thing also to make reference to here before I move on to what I did after that was that the, I had very few points to start with. I had just 21 absence points. And studies have shown that if you want to have good results from your experiment, from niche modeling, you need to have at least 30 special points, 30 points, and I have just 21. In fact, those 21s were kind of just doing, uh, having to split some locations into two because they were quite large. And, and, and then considering uh, subpopulations as distinct special points. So you could see from these results that um, here for the jackknifing results from all this bunch of variables I put in, it shows that um, December temperature was very important. It's one of the, it's the most important variable for this species. But look at the partial, partial dependence plot for, the, for, for December uh, temperature. This is, this is a demonstration of overfitting. It was really, really overfitted, which is a, is a problem. A lot of statisticians have issues with having models that are overfitted. Also, we can demonstrate from the maxent from the AUC generated from maxent the training data was 0 0.97, but the test AUC was 0 0.75. That is a difference of more than 0 0.2, which also means that, which also shows that uh, both the maxent and the random forest models were overfitted. But that was not my problem. My problem was to get the habitat suitability models, uh, maps, to be able to use it for field surveys. So I wasn't really bothered about the overfitting. Nonetheless, I did a lot of field surveys over, the, over those three years, and I had the 758 um, absence points increase to 16, over 1,600 absence points. And then in the process, I discovered one new location. And then, uh, did exactly the same thing. At this point, I had more predictors to use. I was able to generate 72 um, uh, GIS layers representing different aspects of the environment. And so um, I specially thinned the absence points to 90, added it to the presence points, which were 26. And then because I had 60, 72 predictors, I had to thin them down to six. And from those six, I selected the best three because studies have shown, experts have recommended that the number of your absence point, of your presence points, excuse me, divided by 10, that will tell you the number of predictors you should use. So if I have 26 uh, presence points, I shouldn't use more than two or at the very most three variables. And that is and that is a really, really subjective. How do you know what variables to include when you don't even have a clear understanding of the species biology? And that is a clear demonstration of the rare species modeling paradox that I was making reference to earlier. So having done that, um, I did some, some feature selection, uh, feature selection um, reduction, which I'm going to talk on uh, later on. 
and I used six different algorithms. I did ensemble modeling, and also I, I, I was able to generate a habitat suitability map. And because most of the app presence point, I mean, most of the uh, absence points I have were biased towards Nevada, and I have fewer points from California. So the model just said, well, since a lot of the Nevada area has been sampled and we don't have a lot of points, a lot of absence points or even presence points from California, the model just predicted California to have the highest amount of um, habitat suitability. So most of my field surveys also focused in California, even not just to find new locations, but at least to get additional absence points to be able to do a less biased um, and unbiased prediction. And so with that information, additional spatial data, uh, absence points and presence points, I fitted new models in 2018 and I took it out in 2018. And then I had more points, I added more points, absence points increased to 1881. And then I added one new location in, 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 from the 2018 field surveys. And those field survey data, I took them into 2019 modeling. At that point, I had 26 uh, presence points and 1881 absence points. They were specially thin to reduce the number of absence points. I selected the best three predictors to use for the niche modeling from the six uncorrelated uh, predictors. I did exactly the same thing. Uh, I'm not even going into details of how I fitted each of the models, but I used what is called a BioMod HAR package which are several of these algorithms. So I selected the best six algorithms, which, which, have the, uh, uh, which are good for predicting or, or for fitting niche models that have very fewer points. And I included the Maxent and some of these other random forests. I'm gonna go into details of, of the specific algorithms that I use. And then I perform, I assess the, the uh, predictive performance of the models using voice index, TSS, AUC, and specificity. I will also talk a little bit on that, but it's, I, since, I'm, since I don't want to go into details of the statistical details of what I did for each of those. But I had a lot of breakthrough from the 2019 modeling such that I did more studies, more field surveys in California and I was able to increase the number of absence points from 1881 to over 2000 absence points. But interestingly, six new locations were also discovered in the process. How did I do the field surveys? What, what informed the choice of areas that I visited and areas I did not visit? And I, I'm gonna go into details of each of the field sampling techniques I followed. But having 31 points, at least I know that I have more than 30 presence points to start with. And so from there, I could do more robust niche modeling. And the first thing I had to do is to make some decisions because when we are modeling, fitting these models, there's a lot of decisions you have to make in terms of whether you should do cross-validation or you should not do cross-validation, whether the cross-validated data should be independent or not independent. How many variables should you include? It should be the three or four. Uh, and then there are some other parameter tunings which you have to introduce into the modeling process. And so many times modelers just make those decisions on, what they, on, on, on some of these things, but I wanted to be sure that I'm making the right decision. So I did some preliminary modeling to find out how many predictors should I use? Uh, from this 72. So what I was talking about reducing the 72 predictors to six, this is what I did. So there is um, a Kendall correlation. I also did what is called a recursive feature uh, reduction. And then there's another algorithm called Boruta, which I use. So I used those three in combination and that gave me these six uh, most important variables. So each year in 2015, in 2017 or 2018, 2019, I fitted a preliminary model with those six models, with those six variables, and then I select the best three, which I use for the final model because 
for, for me to be able to produce a model that is less overheated, I need to make sure that I don't include too many variables in them. And that means the variables I must introduce must be variables that are not correlated with each other, which will introduce another problem to the modeling in itself. So I did a lot of preliminary modeling to make decisions on what kind of parameter tuning to, to introduce into the models. And these are the six algorithms I use. I use maximum entropy, uh, booster regression trees, and uh, random forest, and as well as the artificial neural network. So those first four I mentioned, they are considered machine learning methods through which most of the work they do is more or less like classification. They, they, they make some recursive classification of the important variables and they break it down into kind of tree building trees and that is where the name random forest even comes in and then we have glm and gam which are regression based uh, algorithms so these are the six algorithms i use and then i also did ensemble modeling and prediction so having done this preliminary modeling i also did additional investigation because what to find out this species is found in areas where there's a lot of balsamorizer or carry, and also areas where you find um, Artemisia boscola. So I wanted to find out, does Artemisia boscola or balsamorizer or carry, do they have any biotic interaction, significant biotic interaction or contribution to the ecological niche of Artemisia weberi? So I also did some additional uh, studies on that and I'm going to be presenting the results for each of those. But for the final modeling, which is what I intend to publish, which is more robust, this is where I used all of my data, uh, uh, especially the 31 app, uh, presence points that I have uh, with the best three predictors and six algorithms and uh, a weighted uh, ensemble. So what happens is that for the model performance, voice index is really important and has been recommended because it, it is a kind of, a, it's a correlation, it's a Spearman correlation between predicted suitability areas versus the actual points that went into the data. So it has been, it has been recommended as one of the most unbiased way of assessing model performance. And that's why it use the continuous voice index. Now, TSS and AUC, those have been traditionally used for model assessment. They, 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 they try to check for the prediction of the model so that it is better than a random model. And TSS is considered um, a, a, a threshold dependent um, assessment and AUC is threshold in independent because it uses a plot of, um, uh, of specificity versus sensitivity. And I'm not gonna go into details of what are those, but specificity, I introduce it specifically because specificity is talking about what uh, is the percentage of omission errors committed by the model. That is area which are actually supposed to be considered suitable for the species, but the model made a mistake and, and classified it as not suitable. So specificity uh, checks for that error. We call it the omission error. So specificity checks for the how, how many, uh, what is the percentage, what is the rate of that omission errors versus commission error. And this specificity, uh, which is omission error versus commission errors, which are errors of classifying an area as suitable when it is in fact not suitable, is what goes into the AUC plot. So these are some of the model performance metrics that, we, that many people use traditionally for assessing the performance of uh, niche models. So here, having often fitted the models, then the next thing is to be able to do the projection. So this is how I build the habitat suitability maps. So this is an explanation of how I build or uh, generated those maps. So what I do is that I selected models, replicates, because each of those six algorithms, I fitted them in 10 replicates. So that is 60 different replicates of models. So 
each of them that has a TSS that is greater than or equals to 0 0.7 because TSS is from 0 to 1. So anything beyond 0 0.5 is considered okay. It's a, it's a good model. So I, I even increase that threshold to 0 0.7 so as to reduce the number of uh, model replicates. So any model that is zero point, that has a TSS of 0 0.7 and above, I average them together across all the six algorithms into what is called an ensemble modeling. So it's called, more specifically, it's called a mean weighted ensemble modeling because I weighted it by 0 0.7 and it's a mean of all the replicates that have that TSS of 0 0.7 and above. So an average of those goes into the ensemble modeling from which I now produce the habitat suitability map by just simple projection of that ensemble modeling. So I have habitat suitability map for 2015, 2018, 2019, and 2020, which is what I use for the uh, field surveys. But I didn't end it there. There is a method called, or a statistic called niche overlap analysis, which you can use to find out how, what is the degree of similarity among different niche maps or the suitability maps that you have. And so I use that uh, niche overlap analysis to find out with additional data being introduced into the niche models of across those years, how does the habitat suitability map for 2015, how is it different from 2018 and 2019 and 2020 and, vice, and, and across all of them? And then I also uh, in, uh, uh, brought all those maps into ArcMap, into ArcGIS, and I counted how many of those suitable cells, how many, or, or how many suitable cells, uh, just a count, a kind of a summary statistics of the suitable cells within each map. So having that data, I wanted to find out how did this, uh, uh, the ecological niche of this species, how has it changed across the iterative modeling uh, over the years. So now to the field sampling, having done all those, talked about all the statistics. So what did I do for the field sampling is that once I generate a map, then I overlaid all the absence points I have all, all together, not specially thinned absence points. All of them, I put overlay all the absence points on the map. And then from there, I select suitable sites that have not yet been sampled. Then that's how I select those sites to decide where to go for field sampling. And that is why I have a huge number of uh, suitable habitats from 2015 to 2017, which took me like three years to be able to go uh, to visit all those areas. And then the second um, sampling technique I used was called, is called adaptive sampling. In fact, I didn't even know this, this, <laughs> that there was a paper written about it. I was just using my own intuition. So look at the map of of the of uh, the current location of the species, you will see that many of those uh, of those locations they are specially aggregated, they are specially clustered together, and that tells you something about this species that wherever you find a location, for example, you can be very certain that not too far from that location, there's likely going to be another location of the species, and so. Uh, we call it adaptive sampling. When you decide to go to sample areas that are not too far from already detected or established location of a species, so it's apparently I realized that there was something is called adaptive sampling. So that is the name given to it. So, and that is how I was able to discover the one population I discovered in 2016 was through adaptive sampling. And some of the new locations I discovered recently were also through adaptive sampling. Then the second uh, hypothesis or the second um, uh, sampling method I used was also is called the abandoned center hypothesis. So there was a paper written by Sagarin and, and, and is it Baines or something like that in 2012, 
which is called adaptive, uh, uh, which is called abundant center hypothesis, such that if you are able to determine the center, the latitudinal center of a species from the north to south, um, they, they propose that the abundance or the density of that particular species is greatest at the core, at the center of the, the geographical center of that species, and it reduces towards the marginal populations. So um, since many of the species are around this area, especially, so at least the geographical core was somewhere close there. So I, 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 I talked to myself that there's likely going to be some more populations out there that have not yet been discovered if that area happens to be the core or the center of the, the geographic center of this species. So I also focus some attention in that area as well. And interestingly, for because many of you are, are staff of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, that the core of Ivisa uh, Webera happened to fall within the Hallelujah Junction Wildlife Area. And that was where at least three of uh, three new locations of the species were discovered recently as early as uh, around May this year. So going to the results, what did I find out? So in 2015, I found out from the modeling that perennial herb cover was very, was the most important. In fact, across all the four years, the perennial herb herbaceous cover was the most important. And that is not surprising because the Avisa webra itself is a, is, an, is a herb, is a forb. And so it's, so it's likely that the herb layer or the, or the, or the GIS layer that covers the perennial herbaceous cover is also a special delineation for where you can find Ibiza webera. And the three variables, they slightly vary across the years. There are some years where actual evapotranspiration was important, and some years cosine aspect was important. And in the 2020, annual precipitation was important, in addition to topographic position index and uh, perennial herbaceous cover. And then, Across the, uh, across the four parameters, the four uh, parameters that I use, for example, for AUC, across all of them, for AUC, for voice index, for specificity, and for TSS, random forests perform the best across all of them, and followed by the booster regression trees. And while the GLM uh, and the Maxim perform poorly, uh, except in, uh, in specificity where ANN, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the neural networks, the artificial neural networks perform poorly. Now, what I also did was to find out whether um, accounting for years, whether, the, whether the, uh, the performance of each of these algorithms that I made reference to, how, how does iterative modeling across the four different mo uh, iterative modeling I did, how does it affect the performance of these metrics. So that is why I fitted a generalized linear mixed effects model on all the metrics to find out what is the effect accounting for years. How does, uh, is there any significant difference in the performance of these six algorithms? And still, random forest and booster regression still consistently perform better than other algorithms. And then I also introduced ensemble models into it and ensemble models perform better than all of them, which I will also talk about later. For those of you who are really interested or maybe you have a lot of um, expert knowledge in statistics and, and niche modeling, there have been a lot of papers that have been written arguing that you should use threshold dependent and not threshold dependent, threshold independent metrics for assessing model performance. CSS is a threshold uh, dependent metrics. AUC is threshold independent. But you can see the performance for the two of them was strongly, um, significantly, and uh, positively correlated. So it doesn't really matter whether you use threshold dependent metrics or threshold independent metrics. Uh, at many, many, in fact, some many studies have shown that uh, it doesn't matter because the threshold dependent and independent metrics will probably give you the same thing. What was really different was the voice index and the specificity. 
And going back to the behavior of each of the algorithms, how they perform, how they fit the models, it, they, they do it differently. Like for example, GAMS use a smoothing function, ANN uses some kind of black box of neural network, which is similar to, to the, how the brain, the, the neurons are connected in the brain. Random forest and BRT are similar. They use some kind of uh, classification and regression trees and they kind of average those trees together to make up one giant tree. That is what is similar in random forest and uh, booster regression trees. Uh, Maxen, depending on, on the kind of features you use, it also does it differently and so on and so forth. So you can see these are the plots of um, how the models perform in terms of the variable, in terms of the variable, uh, the response plots or the response curves of each of the variables as fitted by each of the six different uh, algorithms. And you can see, for example, let me use Anna precipitation, which is the second line of, of plots. You can see that um, for random forest, it tells you that uh, for precipitation, you can, the, the, the uh, uh, probability of occurrence of this species occurs between about 25 millimeters of precipitation to about 35 millimeters of precipitation, and then it drops down. And that tells you something about the climatic niche of this species, that the areas where you can find this species is where there is it, it, uh, areas that receive between 25 and 35 millimeters of precipitation. The same thing was done by, uh, by um, boosted regression trees. But you see others, they did it differently. Some, they just smooth everything and so on and so forth. So it becomes a little bit difficult to interpret. ANN particularly was overfitted, so we cannot even use the result, as you can see, for topographic position index. So these are some of the things that uh, we look into when selecting algorithms to use. Um, so let's move on. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I also perform ensemble modeling and then I compare the ensemble models to, to each of the individual models and ensemble modeling outperform all of them, regardless of whether it's random forest or not. Uh, uh, ensemble models outperform all of them based on AUC and TSS. And uh, I'm just going to move a little bit faster because of time. And so across the four years. So this is another important uh, result. So when I started, because of the overfitting, all the metrics were very high for 2015. But as I added more data, the, the, the metric performance reduced. And then when I added new data in 2020, especially with the new locations discovered, the performance increased slightly. You see that trend in AUC, you see that trend in, in all of them except for specificity where it slightly increased across board. And then for the niche overlap analysis shows that there's a de increasing dissimilarity. So from 2015 to 2020, the niche overlap analysis shows some increasing dissimilarity across the suitability maps. And the number of suitable cells also decreased from 2015 to 2020, which is really good because it tells you, it shows that the models are now learning a lot of things about the data and they know that they cannot just predict or project a lot of habitat suitability. They have to narrow it down, reducing the commission error and reducing the omission errors such that prediction is uh, more accurate. So this is a map. So let's go to the visual part of it. So this, the first one on the left is the 2015. And it shows you areas that are predicted to be suitable. When I, I, I added clean, I cleaned more, more of the data, it did, gives us a, a more readable a niche um, um, a suitability map. And then the one next to it is the 2018. You can see that areas in red are areas that are predicted to be suitable and, and areas in blue, and as it goes on to blue, to shades of blue, it tells you that it is not suitable. You can see the tower there. Um, and so you see that 
periods that are predicted to be suitable was very high in 2015. As more data came in in 2018, it reduced. And then in 2019, it increased a little bit. And then in 2020, it also increased a little bit. And the area um, in box is, is just to zoom in more. The points in green are the existing points that I started with. And the new points that or the new locations that were discovered are the ones in yellow. And I'm going to talk a little bit on that as well. So what does this result tells us? First, random forest and booster regression trees are ideal for fitting these models, especially when you have enough absence points, because these this machine learning algorithms, they are ideal for fitting niche models, uh, which are considered to be non-parametric uh, modeling, which is something similar in ecology. You see that uh, 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 species reaction, species environmental relationship is not linear. It is uh, kind of a dome shape. So it's considered to be non-parametric. And so models that uh, algorithms that, that should be used for ecological modeling should be something that can consider non-parametric assumptions. And ensemble model is even better, much better than any of those ones. And that is one of the reasons why comparative modeling is always advocated and recommended for niche modeling. And the iterative modeling are the and the, and the field surveys resulted in the discovery of at least seven new locations. And it also helped in expanding the range of the species. And I must also mention that from this modeling, uh, the, the California Native Plant Society, they did some vegetation uh, surveys. And that was where they discovered one new location, which happened to become the, the northernmost location of the species in somewhere on BLM land on US 395. And then when I visited the site, I actually found more of the more locations of the species in that area, talking of the adaptive sampling, talking of adaptive sampling. So they discovered it in a particular area. And then I, I scanned more and more areas near it that were predicted to be suitable. And I even found additional locations not far from where they discovered that location, uh, that particular uh, location. So perennial hub layer uh, was the most important because it helps us to reduce the commission errors because it acted as a special delineation for suitable locations for this species. Uh, topi uh, topographical position index helps us to understand the position of the site in relation to elevation. Is it a slope? Is it a basin floor? Is it a ridge? And even studies and field surveys have shown us that that the species is found in gentle slopes and ridges and topographic position index perfectly agrees with the field observation and species reports on this particular species and agrees that uh, this species is found in gentle ridges or slopes. And that also tells us or agrees with previous studies that shows that topographic heterogeneity is very important for species distribution not only in the Great Basin Delta, but perhaps mostly uh, the entire Western United States. And I mentioned earlier that I did some additional investigation to see whether Bazamoriza, Ukeri, and Artemisia abuscula uh, are important, but the biotic interaction is important for, um, for Addisa Webera, but I did not find, in fact, the models I fitted using those, the distribution of those species did not contribute anything to the niche models by this Webera. And that is and that shows you. And the reason why is because Artemisia Boscula and Bazamarita Ukeri, they have much wider geographical spread. So there is no true ecological fidelity between Idisa Webera and these two species. And that, in fact, Bazamarita, you could find it all the way to Colorado, all the way to Wyoming, but you only find Addis Ababa in Nevada and California. And so there's no true ecological fidelity. And that's why um, perhaps why uh, those shrubs did not contribute to niche models for Addis Ababa. Cosine was really important, uh, which is indicative of nothingness, which receives less sunlight. Um, also in the previous modeling, actual evapotranspiration 
uh, was important as well as presentation in the 2020 model modeling, which shows the importance of water availability and stress as limiting factor for the species found in the arid environment. And then you might wonder, we fitted the models in 2015, 2018, 2019, and 2020. So what next? What, what are we there yet? And so this is interesting. I don't think so. I don't think that we've actually fully recovered the entire niche of the species. And it's not just by this way, but for any species anywhere. I don't think we've already fully, we can ever really understand the full niche of any species. That, for example, for Ibiza Webera, there are still many areas that are yet to be surveyed, both on private and public lands, where you perhaps can still find some new locations of the species. And also, for the mere fact that the species was considered to be a phylogenetically young species, so it's still expanding, it's still expanding gradually, uh, and so it has not fully been in equilibrium with this environment. So there is still room for more expansion of this species. And because of that, we have not really, we cannot really fully understand the niche of the species. And I want to thank uh, all of you for listening. I really appreciate your attention. Um, and I also want to appreciate these organizations listed here that have contributed one way or the other through funding or through information uh, on this ecological niche modeling. And at this point, I will take questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we have lots of questions for you already. So yeah, if you take a breath and then we'll, we can dive in. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm gonna start kind of at the beginning. Um, we had a couple um, kind of clarification questions that came in earlier on. And the first one came from Diana, and she asked if you could explain a little bit about pseudo absence points. I think that came in in the first slide when you were talking about it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I didn't want to insult people's intelligence because I didn't know to what extent is, is their knowledge about ecological nature modeling. And, and so, but pseudo absences, wherever we don't have enough, we don't have true absence points, areas where we are. 100% sure that this species has been, is not found in that area. And so for us to be able to get, to use, um, uh, we need some points that we can use in lieu of those true absence points. So what happens is that, for example, in Maxent and some of these presence only niche modeling, they generate a sort of random points across the entire range that we are modeling. They generate a random points of which are considered absence points. So because they have not been confirmed to be absent, that's why they call them pseudo absence points. And, and, and then it, those pseudo absence points are used with the occurrence points for fitting the models. It's very common in random forests and even biomod our package uh, does that, and some of these other packages, they do that such that we can fit our models. There are some other algorithms that don't need it, like envelopes, like uh, surface uh, envelopes, they don't really use it. Some, some other GIS-based um, modeling don't use absent, uh, pseudo absence points, but for many of these statistical models, they require uh, what they call pseudo absence points or true absence points. I hope that uh, answers the question, but I'm happy to yeah. provide additional information on that. All right. Um, the next question, a couple people asked um, kind of versions of this question, but folks wanted to know what data you had for your uh, perennial herb layer. Oh, that yeah, that, that's a good question. So there was some, um, uh, I think it was in 2016 or 2017 that, um, there was a Southwest Gap analysis that was conducted. And from there, we, they, they, uh, it was, they used NLCDs, uh, land cover data set, and some of these other uh, um, regional uh, uh, land cover data set to produce some vegetative cover layer, which include a perennial herbaceous layer, it has a shrub layer, it has a shrub height layer, it has bare ground layer, it has um, 
cover for specifically for Artemisia uh, species like Artemisia tridentata and so on. So it, there is a, a suite of um, of a data set uh, which is publicly accessible. I'm happy to share that data with Whitney later on and you can share it with everybody. Um, but it, it was a publicly accessible data set that was available at that point in time. And I, uh, I was grateful and I was able to find it and then I introduced it into the data set and, and yeah. All right. Uh, our next question came in from Janelle and she asks, did you have sampling bias concerns for your presence data, for example, being correlated with roads, trails, or easy to see areas? And how did you address this in your models? That's a great question. I know uh, for many um, rare species, because of the uh, because of target sampling, there's a, there could be some um, bias in terms of nearness to road and things like that. But it, interestingly, I must um, admit that uh, there was not a lot of bias into, uh, with the data set at the beginning. Uh, there are some, and there are not in some cases, because there are some of the locations of these species that were found deep in, in, in the Humboldt to Yabi National uh, Forest that I actually asked myself, how on earth did they discover those points? Because you have to park your vehicle after driving some hours on some some miles on uh, on on dirt road and then cross some river some creek and walk like 20 miles or 30 miles some of those points um were actually discovered during some um uh, electrification projects they were doing some environmental impact assessment i will give a shout out to carol witham she discovered some of those points some of you may know her um because she was hired at that point in time to do some environmental impact assessment because they were going to do uh, uh, erect some uh, electric electricity cables across um, the region crossing from California into Nevada. So she did some of these surveys and that was when they discovered some of those uh, uh, presence points, some of those locations at that time, it was kind of accidental discoveries, so to say. And so there are some of those points that are close to the road and some that are not really that are really deep in the forest. <laughs> so I, I must confess that, I'm, I mean, I must admit that. And so, uh, but notwithstanding, starting in niche modeling with only about 19 points or 21 points, is really biased, it's really small. And there's no way you cannot avoid overfitting or biased prediction from that. And that was why I had to do the modeling across years to get more data to be able to do more robust uh, um, uh, uh, niche modeling. All right, I have one more quick one from Janelle. I think this will be fast. I'm gonna slip it in. Um, she asked, um, what cell size was used for the variables and predictions? Oh, uh, thank you. I didn't, uh, that was a question, that was an information I missed in there. Uh, so for the, this resolution of the variables and, and uh, that I used was 30 meters, because um, this, in some cases, the species is found within forest gaps, like some of the ones I mentioned that are found deep in the forest, they are found within natural forest gaps. So if I use two coerced, um, a cell size or resolution is going to um, bring a lot of uncertainty into the modeling because it is going to be averaging forest cover versus um, um, forest gaps. And since the species is not found underneath the forest, in the shades of the forest, I have to make sure that I select a cell size as small as possible to capture that vegetative heterogeneity between shrubs uh, uh, in the forest gaps and meadows and the uh, forest cover in the background. So that's why I use the 30 meters resolution. All right, next question. I'm gonna jump around a little bit here. Um, Melanie asks, um, well, first she states that many of the spatial data sets that we work with are specific to California. And she asks, did you find it difficult to find base data layers that spanned California and Nevada? 
And was that a limitation in finding appropriate model variables? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So, um, I, yes, in some cases, uh, there are some of these um, uh, uh, USGS uh, layers that are kind of like regional data set, like they cover the entire South Western US or Southwest or, or some Northwest, so some kind of regional data set. So there is a particular professor at UNR whose lab has been doing a lot of work of generating all of this uh, uh, bioclimatic and, uh, and GIS layers for many, many years. And so they have a data set, which is where I got some of these um, uh, variables which are sort of uh, which are really regional so it doesn't really uh, discriminate between Nevada and California given that uh, there's vegetation um, that cut across both uh, suitable vegetation that cut across both states so thankfully I have those layers layers that I was able to use which are kind of regional data set which has um, the right information I need some kind of uh, GIS processes could be very problematic, especially because uh, if I'm if you're using UTM, for example, California belongs to UTM zone 12, and Nevada belongs to UTM zone 11, and it, it, it could be very problematic doing some GIS processing of those layers before you use them. But with the regional data set, that eliminates that kind of a problem. I had a, I had a problem at the, in 2015 that I will almost be crying in front of the desktop come on, work for me, you know, and I can imagine some of you relating with that uh, while working with GIS data uh, layers. <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that. <laughs> okay, next question uh, from Rafika. She says, um, the populations at Hallelujah, Hallelujah Junction likely burned earlier this fall. Um, that will presumably affect the perennial herb layer. And she asks, how do you think fire would indirectly affect your models by modifying that uh, perennial herb layer? Yeah, that's a very nice, great question. Thank you for that. Well, so I, I must say that, in fact, I was almost tempted to add an additional slide to explain some of the threats of this species, but then, because I feel like I'm talking to conservation managers, so um, perhaps, to, but then I feel like uh, maybe I don't have a lot of time for that, but thank you. Thank you for that question, that, that helps. <laughs> um, so most of the, uh, of the locations where these species are found currently, they, in the last 30 to 40 years, they've undergone series of wildfires. Almost all of them have been burned at one point or the other in the last 30 to 40 years. But what is interesting about this species is that it produces seeds, and at the same time, it produces, it, it also regenerates. In fact, many of the native plants we have in the Great Basin Desert, they produce seeds. At the same time, they also regenerate from their vegetative structures. And so when they go through wildfires like this, if it is a surface fire that is fast, maybe fueled by cheat grass, for example, if it is a fast moving fire, it only burns the surface. It doesn't affect the delicate structures of the, of the plants deep in the horizons, B soil horizon. So the following year, the plants will still come up again. At least in many of the cases, in all, most of the sites I've been to, uh, there was one that was discovered on BLM land in Nevada some, some uh, I think two or three years ago. Right after discovering it, that place was grazed completely by fire. And I visited the site in 2020, and the plants are already coming out again, and the vegetation is kind of gradually recovering from it. So um, after discovering that those locations in earlier <laughs> junction wildlife area, and then the area has gone through fire, it really broke my heart. It really touched my heart. That, oh, my. But um, I can be very certain that um, that those, those sites, the vegetative communities in those sites, they will recover again, either from seeds or from the surviving structures. In fact, I did a study, a separate study, which was recently published a few days ago on the soil seed bank, the role of the soil seed bank in the uh, vegetative communities in the Great Basin Desert. And it shows that these plants, one way or the other, they regenerate, they recover from these surface fires. I don't know if that answered that question, but yeah. Yeah. 
Well, congratulations too on a recent <laughs> publication. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, okay, this next question, I think you 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 answered already a little bit, but I want to ask it just in case we we didn't get to it fully. Um, Daniel asks how you define a true absence point, and if you have any suggestions for those of us looking to define absence. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, when I started and I had only about 19 points to start with, um, I had to work with, I had to, uh, I, I was, I'm so grateful to the Nevada Natural Heritage Program. They had a lot of areas where they are citizen scientists or local botanists, they've done a lot of surveys and they know the species that are found in those areas. So how we define or how statistics uh, in ecologists define an absence point is an area where they've already sampled and surveyed and they are certain that certain species are found there and certain species are not found there. And because um, and I'm very sure the California Department of Wildlife, of Fish and Wildlife, uh, or maybe some other sister organizations have all this data set that they've generated over many years of field sampling, of vegetative sampling, uh, of areas where they are visited and they know what species are found there, what species are not found there. So just getting that information was very, very helpful. In fact, the the manuscript that I'm preparing for this niche model, I also made a recommendation there that it is really important that this very rich data set that have been generated over many, many years of vegetative sampling, they should be made publicly accessible for anybody who wants to do modeling. If you don't have absence point to start with, but you have access to all the vegetative sampling that they have done in other areas, you can easily just go and generate your absence point from there that, okay, this area has been sampled and my species I'm studying is not, was not found there. I can use that point as my absence point and so on and so forth. So it's really important to perhaps to make this data set available so that anybody who wants to do modeling can use them to generate absence point. And so that is how I define the absence point areas that botanists have already confirmed that Ibiza Webera was not found there. And pseudo absence points, I didn't use pseudo absence points in my own data set because I have absence, true absence points to start with. But pseudo absence points are usually generated by the uh, uh, modeling algorithm or the statistical algorithm that you are using for your, uh, for your modeling. So that is kind of like at least a distinguishing factor between pseudo absence points and true absence points. All right. Okay, we've got just a couple more here. Um, the next question is a general one. Um, Annie asks, how was the niche overlap analysis done? Yeah, so there's a particular package in R because most of my work I did it in R statistical software. In fact, there's also, there's another program called uh, Fuzzy, Fuzzy Comparison Tool because that can be downloaded from online um, is a free, uh, free software, I think a Java-based software, but I did mine in uh, R. I used the package called Vegan. So there's a Vegan package that most people use it for community ecology work, for all those stuff. So uh, there's a particular uh, uh, function there that is called niche overlap analysis. So that, if I, you can even Google it, just type niche overlap analysis in R, it will give you the name of the function. And that's what I used. So there are two ways of doing it. Um, I just selected one of the two, which are based on recommendations in literature. So what that uh, um, function does is that it looks at each of the grid cells, each of the cells in the map to find out what is the degree of similarity. Do, do they have the same value? Does one random cell in the 2015 uh, suitability map, does, that have, does it have the same value in 2018? Does it have the same value in 2019? So it does that statistically and uh, across all of the hundreds of thousands of cells that make up one niche, uh, uh, habitat map. And so from that, it generates a single value, which is which ranges between zero and one. One means it is 
100% similar and zero means there's zero similarity. And so values in between tells you how similar the two maps are. And it can be used for any map, not just for niche models. Great. Okay, I think this will, this will be our last question of the day. Um, Jeb asks, to what extent would you expect that the best approach to niche modeling for plants would change for rare species or for species with different life histories, for example, annuals or longer lived species? Oh, wow, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please, can you repeat that question again? I, I didn't get something. Yes, it. yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question was, to what extent would you expect the best approach to niche modeling for plants would change for rare species or for species that have different life histories like annuals or longer lived species? Uh, oh, I see. Right? Okay, so uh, that's a good question. I, I would not expect a lot of changes, um, especially from my understanding of niche modeling, what's really, um, there, there are several factors that affect um, the performance or the behavior of the niche models and life cycle or life history is one of them. Um, how widespread or how rare the species is, uh, is also, in fact, there are many, many studies that have shown different factors that are responsible for, um, for making niche models to have different behaviors based on different uh, properties of the species you are modeling, which is one of the reasons why experts recommend not uh, fitting niche models with not just one algorithm. Use several algorithms and compare between them and find some degree of similarity between them, which is one of the reasons why ensemble modeling is being advocated. So that you, you fit models across different uh, algorithms and find the best of each of them and average them together to make your prediction. So I will imagine that there will be some differences in, um, in fact, for example, some people have done some studies of fitting niche models for invasive species and they behave very, very differently from rare species or range restricted species. But one thing I will also mention though, is that species, studies have shown that species that have very narrow ecological tolerance. Like for example, you find them only in a particular soil, say serpentile soil, something like that. Those species tend to have very accurate niche modeling because, uh, and it's so interesting because it, it means that the niche model is able to narrow down the conditions where you can find that species to only serpentine soils, for example. So there are many, some studies have demonstrated that. So there are many, many life history factors or, or life history properties or different uh, geographical or, or functional traits that can affect the behavior of niche models. I don't know them all. I, I don't know if anybody knows all of them, but, but uh, to be safe, it, it's always recommended to use several niche uh, algorithms and, and see which one is the best and at least do some ensembles of each of them. Great, great question. Okay, well, I think that about wraps it up for us today. Um, I right. want to thank you so much again, Israel, for making the time to share your work with us and also answer all of these questions. Um, before I close us out, is there any last kind of common thoughts you want to share with the group? Yeah, uh, so I just want to thank everybody for your attention. Uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege, it's a great honor. What, uh, presenting this talk uh, to a group of uh, conservation managers. I've always had great desire that the research I do is not just to advance scientific knowledge, but also to have some application to protecting the environment, to, to conserving biodiversity. So I really appreciate um, this opportunity. And I want to shout out to, to Christy and Jeb and Rafika and all the other folks in that team who, who made it possible for me to be able to visit the Lea Junction Wildlife Area, where we actually discovered uh, about three more locations of the species in there. And um, I hope 
to publish this article and make it accessible to everybody. So anybody who wants to go out there to go and look for more populations of these species, please help yourself. I will be so delighted to see new populations discovered. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And please share those publications with us too, and we'll be sure to share them with all the folks um, I'm here at the department. And um, I will I will say there's lots of kudos for you and thank you in the chat box as well. So wanted to relay those too. Okay, well, that brings us um, right to the end here. Thank you again uh, for your presentation. That was wonderful. And thank you so much to all of you for attending, taking time out of your day to um, uh, support the lecture series. So thank you and um, save the date for December 15th and we will see you all next time. Great, take care. <laughs>